My guest today is Frank Lassay. I served for a long time in the state Senate and state assembly in Wisconsin. I uh, served in Governor Walker's administration as well. Uh, then headed a free market think tank, the Heartland Institute, which markets free market ideas and a good significant amount on climate and energy to uh, ideas to legislators across the country, state legislators. I now am the president of Heartland Institute, or the Heartland Institute of Truth and Energy and Climate, uh, which really we um, do exactly that. We are putting out the truth of energy and climate. They're very much related. Uh, the climate narrative is being used to drive some really, really expensive energy policy and harmful energy policy to the West. And, uh, you know, that's a big part of what we'll talk about. And, um, you know, in, in my presentation, we'll talk a little bit that, you know, I'm, I'm a family man. My wife and I are kid rich. We have seven kids together. Uh, we each brought three daughters to our, our second marriage now, 15 years, and we have a young son. And, and I want, we should be striving to um, make life better for everyone, uh, you know, including poor people in other, other countries. And this energy policy and using the climate narrative is doing exactly the opposite of, of that. And that's what, what we'll talk about and the facts of climate. You know, we'll go through it. You've had some really great experts. I Tom, you do a great job in, in doing these interviews. You ask great questions, kind of like Johnny Carson used to, um, you know, before we kind of got fluffy, he'd, he'd ask us really good pertinent questions, which I really always enjoyed. We talked about it in the introduction, so we'll just move on. Uh, this is our granddaughter, Mila. She's now almost two years old. And this is a big reason of what I, I'm doing and why I do this. I want all of us, including your kids, grandkids, everyone else to have a brighter future than we have today. And energy and energy and food supply are really a basis for that for everyone. And then a thriving economy, all of it go together. Uh, so I'm here to offer people uh, take a take the red pill or the blue pill from the Matrix movie is uh, you can continue to kind of live in your rabbit hole and, and not worry about what's going on. But it's going to come and whether you like it or not, uh, some other smart folks have said facts don't care about your feelings and eventually facts will come to affect all of us. And we'll talk about why why that is here. So I'm offering you a choice. I hope that uh, people will hear it, listen, and then do what I advocate at the end. So we're going to talk about energy, electricity, wind and solar, energy in the rest of the world, and then we'll move on to climate and the whys and the politics a little bit. Um, energy is one of the most necessary foundations of civilization. You can see the pictures on the right-hand side you, you, with no energy and you're using wood and dung. Um, and then we have cities because we have energy. Um, it provides us with the good lives we enjoy. Uh, it's great for the environment as well. As people are able to move from cutting down trees, creating charcoal, burning wood, scrounging for dung, their lives improve and the lives of animals, wildlife all improve as well because you take the pressure off, stop cutting down forests and they can regenerate. Uh, all very good things. We should be working on providing and helping people, the 2 billion people in the world, move from wood and dung and crop waste, which are all really dirty, onto things like natural gas, propane, kerosene would even be a major improvement for their health and the environment. Uh, 2 to 4 billion people of the 8 billion people on Earth just don't have enough energy, and more than about a billion people have almost no energy whatsoever. They're kind of living in the upper hand, right-hand picture. Um, they're, they're just, they have none. Um, more people, this is some of the underlying lie of what we're being told on a regular basis is propaganda. More people today are living longer, living better lives. We have rising living, living standards virtually everywhere uh, throughout, at any time throughout history. We have 8 billion people on earth and only about 9% are living in extreme poverty, down from about 50% just 40 years ago. So things are improving dramatically, and we should continue to foster that and work with that. It's good for everyone and the earth and the animals. Um, CO2 emissions, really, they, they track energy because we get the majority of our energy from things that we're burning. And CO2 emissions, and you can see the, the upward trend of both of these, we have a lot more population. Uh, people are living a lot longer, and CO2 emissions are going up. So GDP per capita goes up because of it. Our world population has gone up. And energy just improves our lives in so many different ways. Um, we're getting more food from the same uh, crops or from the same land, the same crops. We're just getting so much more food. And again, that's really good because we can feed this growing population in the world by using the same or even less land to, to do this. 
Uh, this graph shows us, and this is from our world data, I use real good data sources, and um, it shows how much land is used on the bottom. So we're, we're really using the same amount of land to create for cereal production, which are really, you know, things like corn, grain, wheat, uh, things that are staples or rice as well, which pr provides the majority of calories for most of the Asia. Um, and we can see the population has gone up. That's that blue straight line just continues to climb. But then cereal yield is how much, uh, how much harvest you get from the same amount of land. So we're getting a lot more harvest from the same amount of land. We'll talk about that a little bit more. And overall production is up and continues to grow. Uh, virtually all crops around the world, with very few exceptions, even in poor countries where they don't have GMO seeds or, or those things, because of CO2, increased fertilization, better utilization of, of land and understanding of growing, um, are increasing their yields and growing more crops than ever to feed a, a ever-growing population. Um, until 200 years, just 200 years ago, we forget how fast things have changed. People are using dung, like like almost a couple billion people today are, the, the picture on the bottom. But it's, it's a circular thing. People relied on um, wooden dung for energy. Um, and, and that's not the best source of energy for people. Uh, fossil fuels provide 80% of the United States energy and 84% of the world's energy. So there you, we're getting most of our energy, the vast majority, four-fifths, um, from fossil fuels, which are coal, oil, and natural gas. It's interesting. Some people don't even know what fossil fuels are. They just hear the words. Uh, but it's coal, oil, natural gas. And natural gas also is called methane, um, are the other two. But energy is the food that fuels machines that serve us. And you can't have, uh, this is a picture of a refinery on the left. You can't have modern modern things or life-saving equipment without enough energy. Um, the energy also provides us with things that we just take for granted. Most of us have refrigerators, stoves, all the good things, washers and dryers, and the machines and the, the cars that we make and all the other things come from having a reliable, abundant, or affordable energy. That's what gives us good lives. Um, also, it provides us life-saving medical equipment. You can't run a hospital on part-time electricity. Uh, so uh, and around the world, that happens throughout Africa, where they have very intermittent electricity or any, any electricity at all. Um, they have problems with just having basic things we take for granted that when we have a problem, we go to the hospital. And, and without abundant affordable energy, billions of people will die and food costs will go up. So, uh, you know, this is a great picture, I think. It shows that, you know, people living in, in huts with no energy at all, but yet they have a laptop. They're looking at a laptop. Um, I, I think this is really important to make that transition for these folks will be better again for everyone um, and we should be caring about them as Westerners. Um, we often are. We're kind of self-absorbed and thinking only of ourselves, but I think we should care about it. And I remember, and you probably remember, Tom, growing up on the, the TV used to, you know, sponsor a kid, send a couple, you know, send 20 bucks a month and you can help starving kids in Africa. You know, they, they used to report on bad things throughout the world. Now they just report on hot climate events and uh, natural disasters and not much else in this area, which is unfortunate because there's a real human part of it, including not just us in the United States um, or in the Western world, but throughout the world, energy is really important. Um, coal, oil, and natural gas. We have hundreds of years of all of them at present technology, and we have more than 500 years of coal, and that's known reserves. We keep finding more and more, they keep discovering more oil, more natural gas, and there are some that believe, and I share that belief, there are even some that believe oil is being naturally produced within the earth. That's far more controversial. It isn't the consensus view. But it's a growing consensus that natural gas is very likely continued to being um, made through earth's processes. And if the earth is making more natural gas, which I believe it is, then it's an unlimited source of fuel. And it's a very, very clean fuel. Other than carbon dioxide, when you have purified natural gas, you have very little other um, things that could be harmful at all. And carbon dioxide is really a benefit, and we'll talk about that later. Um, fossil fuels. Um, again, we have coal, oil, and natural gas. And they're really limited artificially, which drives up the cost. Whenever you have less supply than demand, costs go up. It's being limited by politicians and policy and banking and ESG. And that's a whole presentation in itself, ESG. Um, but it's it's very insidious, and we should be in, in a policy, I believe, we should have is lower energy costs, not increasing energy costs. 
Energy shortages cause higher prices because again, when demand, when supply is, does not meet demand, prices go up. And food prices also track with energy prices because we you know, don't think about it, but if you've ever been around farming, but the process of planting, harvesting, processing, shipping, getting it to cities, putting it in our refrigerator, all need energy. And when those costs go up, then we all pay more. What could go wrong? In Sri Lanka, they ended very abruptly, just uh, two or three years ago, they, they ended man-made fertilizers, nitrogen fertilizers, which are estimated to feed half the world. Half the world are getting calories because plants grow better with CO2, a little bit warmer, and with fertilizers. And nitrogen is one of the most important fertilizers. It's caused unbelievable hardship. And they listen to, and this is the advocacy of the World Economic Forum, the WEF, and uh, the Western anti-fossil fuel dogma, and they listen to this, and they are paying a heavy price, and they still are. The country has melted down. They, they, they still haven't recovered from this, and, and I, it's going to be years. It's a real bad thing. Uh, another example, and kind of what you might consider a more Western nation, is South Africa. They are now rotating. They only have um, electricity 12 hours a day throughout the whole country. And they have huge coal deposits. They have a lot of coal, um, uh, uh, coal electric plants. And those coal electric plants, um, uh, they've let them run into disrepair uh, because they were making a wind and solar transition. Uh, kind of like the United States, we have some of the same problems here. But they're making wind and solar transition that hasn't happened. And we'll talk about why it's very difficult to make it work if it's even possible. Uh, right now, again, 84% of the world's energy is provided by coal, which is the largest, um, you know, the first on the bottom, and a kind of pinkish is traditional biomass. Again, that's that's wood, dung, and crop waste, which really relates to the premature death, death largely of women. If you can think of, if you've ever been camping for us, or you have a natural fire, or you, you know, campfire, um, breathing all that smoke every day, cooking over those things is really bad for your health. Heating your home with uh, coal, with um, wood is, is very bad for your health. Um, and as from 1950, if you look at 1950, the great curve up also follows the great curve of humanity of the, the 8 billion of us now really have grown. So we're using coal, oil, and natural gas in large amounts. Wind and solar only produce them. 2% or provide 2% of the world's uh, energy at all. Uh, China has the fastest growing economy in the world. Their energy use tracks their economic growth. It's really an amazing, amazing story, but you, a story, but you can see from 1990, uh, some gained to 2000, but since 2000 in the last 23 years, they have skyrocketed their use. And um, you can see that the United States, even though our economy continues to grow, uh, we're actually using less energy than we have before. And India, the other country with 1.4 billion people like China, is continuing to grow their energy use in, in a big way, and it leads to better lives for everyone. Um, here in the United States, this is the United States to total. Where do we get our energy from? 80% come from natural gas and, and oil, natural gas and coal. Uh, almost 99% of our uh, transportation needs are met with, with gas coming from oil, diesel, the other sources of it. But 80% come from it. You can see the biggest chunks are uh, oil, natural gas, and, and just wind and solar are just 4% of our energy use today. And we're being told that somehow we can flip this equation on its head in the next 25 years. That's simply not possible. An economist uh, told me, and it was really interesting, at a great presentation, he said, for every 2% of the GDP growth of the world, we need another million barrels of oil. So oil is directly linked to GDP growth, and we even have now some uh, degrowthers and depopulation. They're floating those ideas amongst the climate alarmists um, and others that we should really just start having less, uh, less of everything, not more, less of everything, and even less people is what they really want as well. Um, most people have no idea the amount of energy the world uses, and I'm going to tell you about that in just a moment. Um, we take it for granted, and we can take it for granted, but I have pictures here of crops, you know, the, the farm on the bottom with big tractors that use a lot of energy. Airplanes use a lot of energy. 
And, you know, and, and as a side, we're being lectured by people who fly very regularly in private jets and private planes that use huge amounts, if it was really important to them, huge amounts of CO2 um, are generated by, by jets and private jets. But meanwhile, lecturing us on how we should all have less and do less. And um, we, we will not have the freedoms we enjoy now without abundant, reliable, affordable fuel. Um, we can't, and if we can't take energy for granted, if we continue to go along the climate alarmist energy policies, it, it will not happen. We it does mean less for all of us, and we'll get to to the point later in this presentation of why it's unnecessary. It's completely unnecessary, and it's it's built on a really interesting narrative um, that serves them and not all of us regular folks. Coal, eight and a half billion billion tons of coal are used annually. Every year, eight and a half billion tons. It's interesting, it provides the equivalent of 41 billion barrels of oil. So eight and a half billion tons of coal is the same, provides the same amount of energy as about 41 billion barrels of oil. Uh, coal is used not only for, for heating, but it's used for electricity, steel, cement, graphite, carbon fibers, hydrogen, firefighting foams, medicines, tar, synthet synthetic fuels. Uh, during World War II, part of the reason the Germans lost in World War II is they started to run out of energy. They couldn't put their tanks in the field. They couldn't transport things. They didn't have enough gas to put in their, their airplanes to go up and fight their war efforts. So they really pioneered and put it into general use and, and attempted to use the very uh, rich deposits of coal Germany has in turning it into a synthetic fuel. Uh, it, it's possible today. It's just not economical. It costs several times more to use coal turned into fuel or liquid fuels as it does to use gas uh, turned in or oil turned into gas or diesel. 98% uh, of our transportation is oil dependent. We use 101 million barrels of oil a day. 101 million barrels of oil a day. That's 30, 36 billion barrels of oil every year. People just, it's, it's hard for us to get our head around that. And the United States uses 20%. We use 20 million barrels of oil each and every day to uh, provide the lifestyle that most of us, the great lifestyle most Americans enjoy. Natural gas, we use 135 trillion cubic feet of natural gas each year, and it's growing in its use. Natural gas supplied 38% of U.S. electricity in 2021. It stayed about the same. And again, it's also called methane. Um, it, it's a carbon and hydrogen molecule, CH4. So it's got a little bit of carbon, more hydrogen. More than 6,000 everyday products are made from oil, coal, and natural gas. Virtually everything we touch and use every day from your toothbrush in the morning uh, to even your, your bed sheets at night and everything we do, wear, touch, do, have uh, has an oil, coal, or natural gas component built into it. And um, you know, across the bottom of the next slide, I'll show a little bit more. Um, we use make synthetic rubber from it. We Our tires are made from it. Things we don't even think about, cli um, cleaning products, asphalt, cements made with it, cosmetics, plastics. These are uh, things, where a, a barrel of oil is used for a whole variety of things, not just gasoline. Again, going back to just a reminder, again, until 200 years ago, people were primarily using dung oil or dung um, dung crop waste and um, wood for their energy needs. And we've come a long way, baby. And also it's um, Michael Schellenberger does a really great job in his book and talks about the fact and, and also the in invention of kerosene helped save the whales because we were using whale. The wealthy could afford it. They were using whale oil uh, for lighting at night and poor people were using candles and kerosene really saved the whales. And he also uh, talks um, um Michael Schellenberger in his book talks about how uh, tortoise shells were used as an early form of plastic and how plastic replaced um, tortoise shells for that malleable combs and other things that we just take for granted with plastic. And every time I open up a plastic bag or our food comes wrapped in plastic, it helps preserve the food for us and keep it safe for us from bacterial growth and all those other things that we just kind of take for granted. But those are all fossil fuel derived things that um, and if they're, you know, the net zero world that they keep talking about, if they're successful in doing that, uh, that really means that, you know, where is this plastic going to come from? Well, you know, where are these life-saving things that we have going to come from? 
Um, electricity is necessary for, elect, um, for economic advancement. It's also necessary for climate control in our houses and our businesses and buildings. And it's also required for labor, sa labor saving machines. But electricity really is the biggest next step after you get uh, other types of fuel to really drive an economy and make people's lives a lot, lot better. Interestingly enough, the United States electricity usage has not grown significantly in the last 23 years. It's remained pretty well flat, but yet we've been investing hundreds of billions of dollars in additional electricity capacity, closing down reliable paid for uh, coal plants and natural gas plants and replacing them with part-time wind and solar. Um, part of the reason, even though our economy has grown, where our population has grown, is we have more efficient the computers we're all watching this on now, or our phones, uh, all become more and more efficient. Our lighting has become more efficient. So uh, our TVs use a lot, our electricity, our TVs, our refrigerators, our washers and dryers, all those things use electricity on a, a, a per unit basis than they used to. So our electricity uh, demand has not grown. And, and of course, what it means is, is in areas that haven't grown in population, it really has shrunk. And in areas that have grown really rapidly, it has grown. Um, electricity and hydrogen, people don't often understand that they're both secondary energy sources. What I mean by that is they have to be created by something else. Electricity has to be made. Hydrogen has to be made. You don't mine hydrogen, find hydrogen. It has to be made by something else. <clears throat> and hydrogen is a new part of the climate narrative to solve problems that don't exist, um, but it's a very expensive, inefficient way to store energy. <clears throat> electric grids. You need to understand that electric grids can store no power at all. So demand must be met by supply all the time, and it has to stay in near-perfect balance all the time and kind of interestingly, in the United States, it's 60 hertz, which is just 60 vibrations per second. In the rest of the world, it's 50 hertz or 50 vibrations per second. But that has to stay really right at that 60 or 50. And that's the reason why, um, you know, when you take your blow dryer outside the country, it might not work quite right um, because it's designed for that 60 hertz grid. And um, it's just really important. And you, if you have too much power, or not enough power going on that electric grid, you'll have blackouts. And you can't run a hospital very well when you're having regular blackouts. I mean, it's gotta be horrendous for people in South Africa now who are used to near full-time electricity going to half-time electricity. And just as an interesting aside, in most of the world, the, the, the international definition of being electri electrified is on average four hours of electricity a day. So I looked into it when the last COP was in Egypt, and they claimed that the nation was 98% electrified. But the definition of electricity is an average of four hours a day. So you might get to, you know, 24 hours of electricity twice a week, and they'd say you're electrified. I'd say uh, for Americans, you know, not having electricity for 15 or 20 minutes or a few hours is a big problem. We shouldn't tolerate that at all. Uh, wind and solar. Uh, we've been told a lot of misinformation about wind and solar, and we'll talk a little bit about it. First off, have the, one of the big lies of wind and solar or misrepresentations is called a capacity factor. What a capacity factor is, is how much energy, the nameplate value, if you have 1,000 megawatts of nuclear power, it is not equaled by 1,000 megawatts of wind power. It really needs about 3,000 megawatts of wind power, and wind power is still part-time. Nuclear power produces at 100% all the time. They typically shut down a nuclear power plant one week or two weeks a month. That's why it's at 92%. So if you have a 1,000 megawatt nuclear power plant, it produces a 1,000 megawatts of, of electricity on a, a regular ongoing basis. They call that base power. It's really important. We should have more nuclear power, in my opinion. Uh, and these are actually kind of generous. Uh, I've done the math uh, really closely, and you have a lot of good records out there, except out on the Great Plains where you do get about 40% capacity factor for wind. And what that means, again, is if you have 1,000 megawatts of wind towers out there, you'll get about 400 megawatts of power when the wind blows. Uh, the same thing with solar here. They say it's about 25%. In Wisconsin, it's less than 15%. Most places, it's about 20%. California does a little bit better. But what that again means is if you have 1,000 megawatts of solar power, it's going to produce about 200 to 250 
Uh, in Wisconsin, only 150 megawatts of, of electricity power with that. So it's kind of an important concept to understand because people think, oh, well, you can close a 1,000 megawatt coal plant and just replace it with 1,000 megawatts of wind or solar. Uh, no, you really can't. And then you still have the part-time problem. But, you know, what provides electricity? And this is what I always ask kind of the, the those who have bought into the leftist narrative that you can run an electric grid on wind and solar. And I never get an answer from them on, What's going to provide power on a cold, dark, windless night? And, well, you know, they just change the subject. They won't answer. Um, or they'll give you a flippant, goofy answer like, oh, the wind and, soil, wind and the sun is always shining someplace in the world, so you're going to ship you know, electricity all over the world. It's the kind of crazy talk. You know, right now, California is getting coal-fired power, um, coal electricity generated by coal from Utah. And they're shipping it from Utah all the way to Los Angeles. And you lose about 5 to 15% of the electricity you generate when you, transmit, when you transmit it those long distances. It, you just lose it over time. So that's additional cost that goes into all of this in, and, um, in addition to paying for those transmission wires. Um, this is a, a grid. This, this is a picture of what happened when more than 500 people died because the electricity died in Texas. There should be a song on that. Maybe somebody should do a country western song on that. But the black line that goes squiggly across the top is the demand, how much electricity Texas needed during this, uh, this time period. And then on the bottom, it's blue and gold. It shows how much wind and solar were being produced, how much energy was being produced by wind and solar. And um, there's an interesting weather pattern that often happens when it's very hot or very cold, and New York is going to run flat into this as they tr transition and pretend that they can run their grids on wind and solar. New York has a pattern of uh, August get very hot, very humid, and very cloudy. So you don't produce much solar, and at the same time, the state becomes very still. So for a week or two or three, you might get this, this normal weather pattern, in August in New York, where it's just hot, humid, super hot, like 90, 100 degrees, and humid with no wind, and you don't get much solar production. What are they going to do then on a full wind and solar uh, electric grid? What happened here in, in Texas, again, is you can see on the bottom of, of the, this present or this graph is that wind and solar produce very little electricity. And then you know, the spinners keep spinning, and the, the articles came out, well, um, natural gas failed. Natural gas failed. That was the reason they had to shut down everything. Well, actually, it was climate policies again, is because natural gas doesn't flow very well when it's super cold. So they heat the pipes, and they actually have to heat it in the ground to get it out of the ground and fill the pipes to deliver it, because it's just-in-time delivery. You can't store a lot of natural gas. That's the benefit of nuclear and coal as well, is you can, you can put a lot of fuel and stockpile it. We used to stockpile three to six months of, of coal next to a coal plant so that it was there and available in case you needed it. But the, the natural gas plants in Texas ramped up five times. They started producing five times more electricity than they normally did. And then that wasn't even enough because, well, part of the reason wind and solar just were producing almost nothing and they're relying heavily on it in Texas. And um, then what happened was is they started shutting off areas of the grid. That's what they do to keep load matching is they black out certain areas. They forgot to add the natural gas pipelines to the natural gas plants to the critical electric list. Why was it should have been on the critical electric list? Well, they used to use natural gas to high, uh, heat the pipelines, but in a deal cut with um, EPA to lower their CO2 emissions, they switched that heating to electricity instead of natural gas because they thought it would be a little bit better for the uh, atmosphere. So that exacerbated the problem. So the spinners, of course, you know, latched onto that and said it was all natural gas plant, plant fault. Well, if you had no natural gas at all, you can see what you would have had with wind and solar and the whole state would have had to shut down. And when a grid shuts down completely, it's very hard to start back up. And it also, if you don't do it planned, you can burn out all kinds of transformers, which are in short supply right now, and it could be weeks or months without electricity. Uh, Scotland has cut down 16 million trees. The craziness of this whole wind and solar climate policy is Scotland's cut down 16 million trees to put up wind towers. 
Now, you know, trees uh, sequester CO2 and produce oxygen. I'd say they're a pretty good thing. And then these wind towers they're putting up only last about 25 years because they are the, as tall as 50-story buildings. They're made of metal. And that metal fatigues because they have these huge, big blades that keep spinning all the time. Well, not all the time, only 30, 30 to 40 percent of the time. But they wear out. And when they're taken down, they aren't be able to be recycled. And then you have to rebuild new ones. So this whole idea that this is sustainable or renewable, uh, yeah, I guess you got to keep renewing them every 25 years. So maybe you can call them renewable on that level. But that's really expensive, folks, really expensive. Um, because wind and solar are part-time, in order to have full-time power, we have to pay for both. We have to pay for full-time and part-time pair. That's why your uh, power, that's why your electric bills keep going up and are going to continue to go up. They, um, as they add more wind and solar, we have to continue to keep our natural gas, coal, and nuclear plants online. And we've been closing them down too fast, and that's really a problem. We shouldn't be closing them down at all for national security and economic security uh, reasons. But paying for full-time and part-time power is expensive. It's like having a second car that you only use once in a while. Um, you know, if, if you bought a wind or a solar car that only worked when the wind was blowing, uh, you'd have to keep your full-time car because you couldn't use it because you might not even be able to, you couldn't use it to go to work because the wind might not be blowing to get you home. And that's the underlying problem of what we have with, uh, with our wind and solar and uh, being added to our electric grid. Uh, then the sweet deal that they get. So even the next big lie is that wind and solar are cheaper. Wind and solar are cheaper. We hear that drumbeat all the time. Well, this is how it works, folks. To the tune of hundreds of billions, literally hundreds of billions of dollars, our federal taxpayer dollars and state dollars in many, many states, we pay for 30% of the building costs of new wind and solar. Then when they produce wind and solar electricity, we give them 30% of their costs for producing it. So they, and then what's worse, it's a, and more of the lies. So it's heavily subsidized 30%, 30% is that they get paid the highest price that the utility accepts um, for their electricity generation. So if natural gas is most expensive, the wind and solar, we don't get the cheaper wind and solar rate that, that they get paid. They get paid the natural gas rate. So it's no savings to electric payers, electric user payers. The industry calls this take and pay. So whatever they take, they pay the highest amount. Um, this means that we save nothing. And it, to help people kind of get your head around this to understand it a little bit. So Amazon wants to keep delivering things all the time, um, very timely. They'll get it out of their they get it out of their warehouses and they get it to our doorsteps quickly. And they use lots of trucking and delivery services. So say they're they're gonna go out and Amazon wants to keep it up, just like electricity. We want to have electricity all the time. So we want to to this analogy works in that way. Amazon wants to have that. So they hire some people to deliver their goods all the time. And they go out and they bid this out. And they have one wind solar company that's being subsidized by taxpayers, both for buying the trucks and for everything that they do, they get 30% back. And the same thing with a solar truck company, delivery company, the same deal. They, they All their trucks are 30% paid for by the government and 30% of whatever they can generate gets reimbursed to them as well through the government. Then the Amazon has other non-subsidized deliverers that they have to have because those wind and solar deliverers only work when it's winds blowing and the sun's shining. So they have to have full-time worker delivery workers too. They pay all of them the same price. What kind of business would do that? And we'd be paying even, you know, we'd be paying more for Amazon's goods if that was happening for no good purpose. So it's not, um, you know, this is all propaganda and it benefits politicians. The media is actually being paid tens of millions of dollars to propagandize us, to tell us the climate is bad, the weather's bad, it's too hot, uh, telling us wind and solar are great, height covering up the truth. This serves politicians and the green industrial complex, and we all are paying for it, even though it's a small amount every month, but it adds up. It's huge dollars that we're all paying. Our electricity, since we aren't using more of it, should actually be cheaper because natural gas, because of, of fracking, the shale revolution, is much cheaper than it was 25 years ago. We should have a lot less costly electric rates, not more expensive electric rates. 
what could you do if your electric bill was half of what it is now? You'd have more money to spend on things of your priority. Um, then on top of this, paying for a full-time and a part-time electric grid, they want to build thousands, they, they're already doing it, thousands of miles of very expensive transmission wires. Because <laughs> they want to deliver it from and turn rural areas into industrial wind and solar uh, installations and then transport that electricity from um, the rural areas to all the cities where they really need it. It's just very expensive. Doing wind and solar, keeping natural gas, coal, and everything else, and uh, um, transmission wires is very expensive. Uh, you can expect our electric rates to quadruple over the next 10 to 20 years. They will at least double in the next handful of years, particularly if they continue to ramp up adding more wind and solar. Um, and it won't make a difference to the weather, the temperature, or the climate. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go forward into the next part of the presentation. Um, meanwhile, just remember, communist China, India, Japan, Asia, and Africa are building hundreds of coal plants, and they're not using clean coal technology to do it. The reason they're not is it costs hundreds of millions of dollars up front to put it in, and you lose 20% of your electricity. It costs you 20% of your electricity by using it. So they aren't using it, so they're using dirty coal, and they're building literally hundreds of coal plants right now as this presentation is going on. Um, and each of those coal plants that they're building lasts 50 to 75 years. So this idea that China is going to build hundreds of coal plants now and then tear them down or stop using them in 10 or 15 or 20 years is just made up bunk. Uh, and again, China burns more than 4.5 billion tons of coal every year. China has the fastest growing economy in the world. And again, that chart from earlier, as you can see how they have ramped up their energy usage and it tracks with uh, their growing economy. The same thing with India. Uh, and the other dirty secret of all this is the coal and natural gas plants have to be kept in spinning reserve, it's called, or in reserve. So you can't turn them off and on. I, I help regular people understand this. If you needed boiling water at a moment's notice, you'd have to keep it almost boiling or boiling all the time on your stove. It's the same thing. When the wind stops or clouds go over the, the solar panels, you have to kick in some other electricity or you have electricity shortages. So you have to keep those natural gas plants and, and coal plants running all the time. You have to put fuel in them, but they aren't putting much electricity to get paid for on the electric grid. So their costs, when they do sell electricity, keep going up. And again, wind and solar get paid the highest price, so our electric um, costs keep going up as we add more, and it's displacing this full-time electricity on-demand electricity. Now, wind and solar are the future. To get to just half of our electricity use from wind, we'd need another 350 wind towers. We're only building about 5,000 a year, so we're on the 70-year plan. So this craziness of shutting down coal plants, natural gas plants, is, and they're finally realizing it. Two, three years ago, they, they, they were, oh, there's no problem, nothing to see here. But now that we're starting to get electric shortages when it's really hot or cold, and it'll come all the time if they continue on this path. And we need 8,000 or and or, you could do it in a combination, 8,000 square miles of solar panels um, and we need to spend at least $3 trillion on transmission wires to move that electricity around from where it's being produced uh, to someplace else. To give you an idea of the scale, uh, just in the industrial installations in Florida, they have 7 million solar panels, 7 million solar panels, and it provides just 2% of the electricity of Florida only when the sun shines, 7 million panels. So we're talking about hundreds of millions or billions of solar panels that will last about 25 to 30 years and will have to be disposed of. <laughs> Hydrogen. Hydrogen is the next interesting thing, and that's the new, I, I think it's a talking point. I think it's a scam because there's not enough lithium in the world, and we'll get to that a little bit. There's not enough metals in the world to make uh, literally tens of millions of electric, electric vehicle batteries and industrial batteries too, and they're expensive. So they're talking about trying to store that electricity or store power in hydrogen. 
In order to make hydrogen, you need 13 times more water than the hydrogen you produce. And then you need 50 times more to cool it down because you superheat it and you electrocute it. Then you cool it down. Then you have to super freeze it to almost absolute zero. Then you have to compress it to 30 times atmosphere, which is three times the, the pounds per square inch PSI of a scuba tank. This process costs you at least 35% of the energy you're producing. Um, there's a proposal now to capture some of the $9 billion the federal government is doling out is to use what's called pink hydrogen, which is made from nuclear power. So they're going to take nuclear power and do these things that I just described, which is going to cost them 35% of the electricity generated. Rather than just using the electricity from the nuclear power, they're going to lose 35% to turn it into hydrogen. And we have no, we have no hydrogen infrastructure and if you remember, some of the younger people won't even know what I'm talking about, but remember the Hindenburg, it blew up. Hydrogen is volatile and it escapes. There's a lot of um, technical issues with it. Um, and we have no infrastructure for it. Again, hugely expensive to build that infrastructure. Um, so I think it's an energy talking point. Again, hydrogen is storage. It has to be made from something else. Right now, there's about 86 million tons of hydrogen made in the world and 95% of it come from fossil fuels. Those are bad because they produce CO2, according to the climate alarmists. Um, and actually, CO2 is good. But why would you lose energy making hydrogen other than for a talking point? We're going to spend $9 billion on this boondoggle. And right now, they're actually building one. They've given $500 million. And I haven't been able to tease out if it's just a loan guarantee or the actual loan or whether it's a complete grant. Um, in Verde, Utah, in the edge of the desert, where they're very short of water, they're going to build a hydro green hydrogen hub. And the first $500 million, half a billion dollars has already been let, really to dig um, in, into the salt domes there, storage capacity for this future green hydrogen that doesn't exist. Never mind the fact that Utah gets 4% of its electricity from wind and solar. Uh, they're heavily reliant on coal, and somehow we're going to put in the desert a green hydrogen factory that needs lots of water. And the short in the wa in the water shortage of the West is just stupid, expensive waste of money. Industrial batteries and hydrogen energy storage are they're expensive and they're not ready for prime time at scale. The metals needed. Here's the metals needed. And these on the right-hand side are the number of years at 2019 rates to produce the metals needed to make the so-called energy transition. And this is just for the first generation. It isn't for the second generation, because remember, all these things wear out after 20 to 25 to 30 years. So they have to be rebuilt. There's very little uh, recycling available at all. And um, we need 29,000 years of germanium. Not even sure what that is, but they use it in trace amounts. It's hard to come by. Well, I need almost 10,000 years of mining at today's mining and processing levels uh, just for the first generation of wind, solar, batteries. And we'll need the 3,000 years, 33,000 years, or 3,300 years for the graphite. And graphite's used for all kinds of different things um, besides the energy transition that's needed. So the idea that we can just ramp all this up over the next 25 or 30 years is just plain, it's not reality. In fact, it's going to turn into a nightmare. People are going to start to understand that because it's going to drive up the cost for everything. Uh, the root cause of today's re reliability problems, and they're growing, uh, you can Google that up, uh, reliable grids, electric grids, you're going to find out that we are starting to notice this problem. But it's really, we are, we're trying to add uh, part-time wind and solar. We aren't adding even enough of it, even if it would work. And we're closing down coal and natural gas plants faster. And we're trying to do this fairly fast. We're actually very, very fast by, by historical standards, plain nutty. Um, Californians have more blackouts than any other area of the country. And they are leading a transition to wind and solar. They're importing 30% of their electricity, by the way. And they're paying double the national average. Germany is playing, paying four times the national average for electricity. Uh, they're the leaders in Europe. Germany and Denmark are both very highly costed electricity because as you add more wind and solar, 
you have to continue having um, natural gas and coal and nuclear, so you end up having more and more costs. Germany just came out and said they're going to need to build 50 more natural gas plants, electric plants, in addition to trying to go 100% wind and solar. So it gives you an idea. Um, and their electricity usage has declined, not increased. And Biden and the Democrats say that California energy policy is a model for the nation. It's a model for the nation. And they say this with a straight face and nobody calls them on it in the media, or at least they won't publicize that. Energy and food are necessary for civilization and life as we know it, and a lot can go wrong. And we are at the beginning edge of that lot can go wrong. Oh, what did I have there? Um, if we, we need a smarter, better energy policy. Now to the rest of the world. This is CO2 emissions. China, who gets a buy. China, who the, the climate religionists, the climate alarmists, nobody wants to talk about them. Nobody wants to go on about them. John Kerry was just there talking with them about climate and emissions, and they kind of told him to very nicely pound sand. Um, as they build hun literally hundreds of coal-fired power plants, they are emitting more CO2 than the next 29 industrialized countries combined, including the United States. Communist China burns more than half of all the coal in the world. They're the biggest producer of coal. They have five years of, of coal stockpiled. They get 56% of all their energy, not just electricity, all their energy from coal. India gets 75% of all their energy from coal. And they want to get even more energy, and they are building coal plants because it's part of their strategy to better their people. They still have hundreds of millions of people who don't have enough electricity and whose lives could get a lot better, and the environment could get a lot better. And in fact, the environment in India is improving as they're industrializing because it takes the pressure off the natural resources. Again, 8.5 billion tons annually, even in Europe. On the bottom left-hand side, even in Europe, they are using 8.5% more coal than they did last year. Uh, Germany, ironically, tore, tore down some wind towers in order to expand a coal mine because of the, the problems they're having with getting enough fuel. Um, Trump warned, warned them about getting their, their fuel from Russia, their traditional kind of energy aggressor, and uh, they laughed at him, and now they, they paid the price, and in fact, they're burning more coal in order to make it up for it because having electricity and keeping the lights on is really important. Climate. Climate always changes and always will. That is a fact no one disputes, um, and all of us agree that it always changes. And I think that's part of the underlying assumed lie of the climate alarmist narrative is that somehow we can stop the weather. Somehow, if we had less CO2, somehow there would be less weather, there would be less weather events, somehow. That's just not true. The weather's going to do what the weather's going to do, and largely driven by the sun. Uh, over the last 450,000 years, this uh, blue line's going up and down, squiggling along, top says interglacial, the bottom says glacial. This shows that our temperatures have risen and fallen, and they always do, and they always will. We at the, the far right-hand side, we're in the interglacial that was not as warm as the previous interglacials that have gone on. And um, it's going to come to an end at some point, folks. And that's because of the way the Earth goes around the sun. And it's just going to happen whether we like it or not. Or if you buy the climate and air, alarm narrative, we might want to really ramp up CO2 to prevent the next, CO, the next ice age. Uh, this shows between the two the previous temperatures over the long term. This is 600 million years before president, present. So 600 million years ago starts in the left. It goes all the way over to zero on the right. It shows that the temperature is the red lines. The green lines are CO2. You can also see that we had a lot more CO2. If you look over on the far right-hand side below the today, um, it was almost CO2 500 million years ago was almost 6,000 parts per million. And when it was that high, because there was so much plant activity, there was a lot more oxygen in the atmosphere. Because when plants grow better and you have more of them, they put more oxygen in the air, which is good for animals and people. Um, then you can see uh, that it, as time has gone on, the relationship between CO2, sometimes they're going up, sometimes they're going down. There's not a long-term uh, uh, relationship between CO2 and temperature. 
Uh, Greg Wrightstone, uh, myself, uh, and the CO2 Coalition, they have great information, by the way, if you're looking for the science of this with some great members on it. And I know Tom has interviewed Greg Wrightstone and others who are mem members of the CO2 Coalition. We were disappeared from LinkedIn. We were disappeared. Gone. I can't access LinkedIn anymore. I've been banned and blocked from LinkedIn. Uh, this, this sort of stuff, the censorship and disappearing, and they actually disappeared physical people leading up to World War II in Europe, is going on in the whole area of climate narrative all the time. And all the big tech companies are doing this to perpetrate this, um, many call it a scam. Uh, this, again, is the Vostok ice cores. Uh, this is where they drill ice cores in. They measure the, the chemicals, the CO2, the temperature. It leaves traces in these ice cores, amazingly enough. And this shows over the last, uh, from 150,000 years to 100,000 years ago. This is from a, a climate scientist, Joanne Nova. Um, and you can you know access her site and look at this information that the temperature actually, the carbon dioxide actually follows the temperature. And this is well documented. And this was actually in Al Gore's little, little um, movie that helped kick all of this off. He shifted these to make it look just the opposite. So he misrepresented the truth by making it look and claiming that CO2 leads temperature, uh, not the other way around. Uh, this shows an uh, Antarctica ice core. So the primary two places, the ice is very, very deep, miles deep, like the interglacial or the glacial periods that we had where Madison, Wisconsin, was a mile and a half under ice when it gets that glacial top period. Ice migrates down and freezes all, virtually everything. But this shows, it, again, the temperature is in blue and uh, the red is CO2. And you can kind of see when you look at the top peaks how CO2 follows temperature. Um, and just like a cold can of beer or uh, Coke or something will hold more CO2 than a warm can, it's the same principle, the ocean's off gas. Um, and this kind of shows how the air temperature lags um, the sun. What happens to the whole basis of our weather system is the sun warms the equator areas the most. It's warm there. Um, it causes the oceans to evaporate a lot of air, water, uh, moist, wa moist air, warm air is lighter, it floats up, then it starts going towards the poles where it's colder, and, and this is um, all just part of it, and as the oceans warm, they off-gas more CO2. As they cool, historically they've done both, they take more CO2 in. Uh, but this is just a sort of real kind of quickly, but the Earth up on the top, we're in a position right now, those two pictures of the globe, one is wavy and the other is kind of stable, where I, I term it like a Frisbee sits on top of the North Pole and then the, the cold air of the North Pole just sits up there. Or we're in a real wavy period right now where it's wavy around and this oscillation that's going back and forth between the, the Frisbee at the top keeping the cold air in or the fingers of hot and cold coming down uh, alternate. It always has. It's just part of the history. We don't have a lot of, of knowledge of how that all works yet, but we're in a wavy period right now. So what the climate alarmists do is when the, the warm temperatures go north and um, you know warm up Europe or something, you get all kinds of reporting of it and no talk about the cold right next to it. So when Spain was really hot, Central Europe was really cold. So they tell us about Spain, but they don't tell us about Central Europe. And this goes on around the world, this, this kind of temperature scam, the propaganda that they're getting paid to perpetuate. Also, CO2, as it warms, it is a warming gas. It is a greenhouse gas. Um, you know, that's, there's only a few people who want to dispute that. But it's also not linear. So what that means is, is as you might add more molecules of CO2, you don't get more warming from it. Most of the warming we're getting from CO2 has already occurred. We can double and triple CO2 in the atmosphere, going from about 425 parts per million to 800, which will take 200 years, by the way. It'll take 200 years to double our CO2 in the atmosphere, and we'll get very little warming caused by that. Uh, the other part of this is, is only for when well, this says, this study by scientists tells us that with carbon-14 dating data, uh, dating of the CO2 in the atmosphere, only 12% of the atmosphere added since 1750 is caused by man. 
That's something else that most people have no idea, that the Earth is always releasing CO2. Termites release more CO2 into the atmosphere than man. Rotting things release CO2. It goes up, it gets recycled, plants take it up and use it. They grow, they create things that we all eat. And we're the nature produces like 50 times more CO2 than man does and recycles all of its own, plus 60% of man's. And I think if we planted more trees and made the earth greener rather than browner, we would probably see even more recycling and more oxygen being produced by plants. Uh, the temperature, we one of those other big lies narratives, it's never been warmer, never been warmer. Well, that's just completely, totally false. And the first IPC, the UN, as the climate scam organization, the IPCC, the first ones came out and had graphs very similar to this, but that didn't fit the narrative. So they erased them, and we we'll have a little slide to deal with that. But it's been warmer in the past, and warmer times are better. Warmer times are better. Uh, the Roman Empire came during the warm time. Medieval warm period was really great. Uh, the, the ancient Egypt was really a good place when it was warm. Warmer is better for virtually everyone. Vikings grew barley in Greenland and settled Greenland from about 980 to about 1350, and then they froze out. Um, the alarmists try to downplay this. They've claimed that it's only in Greenland that it was warm. That's completely and totally false. There's studies from around the world that it was generally warmer nearly everywhere. And weather is very local. So there can be pockets, as you may have, may have noticed sometimes, you can drive from one place to the other and weather changes and temperature changes dramatically. Um, they also had tree roots piercing bodies. It's too cold in Greenland for trees to grow. And Vikings really needed and wanted trees in order to build their things. Um, and you can't grow trees there now. So it's obviously much colder now than it was from about 980 to about 1350, 1,000 years ago. Also, here's from a 5,000-year-old tree stump. I mean, this is coming out of the Arctic as glaciers up there are receding. And this is happening around the world as glaciers are receding. We're finding trees, we're finding artifacts from the medieval warm period in Norway. There's retreating glaciers in some mountain passes, and they're finding predominantly artifacts and things very well preserved from the Roman warm period and from the medieval warm period. It's interesting, the Romans were way up in Norway, um, but they're finding things from those period of time, very well preserved, covered by the ice. And in fact, the um, the, the researchers and the archaeologists and others say, you know, we got to get up there all the time because once they get exposed to the elements, they, they degrade very rapidly. So they've been very well preserved, and it means it's been it was warmer back then. Uh, what happened was, is the original IPC reports, the blue line showed the temperature, how it was a lot warmer during that medieval warm period. And the top, it's, uh, you know, from well, 1,000 to about 1,300, it was very warm. And then this Michael Mann, who's a scamster and got paid very well at the, now at the University of Pennsylvania. He was at Pennsylvania State. And by the way, the Chinese, the communist Chinese are chipping in a lot of money to the University of Pennsylvania. I wonder how much of it gets filtered through. But he came up with this hockey stick where he used and cherry picked a variety of trees and um, said that, oh, no, there was no medieval warm period. And then he switched over to temperature gauges because the trees no longer showed a warming uh, that we're having right now. And it, it just is false. But yet, even though it's been proven false, and I know you've interviewed some of the great guys who have proven that in depth, um, they continue on, and you can still find it on Wikipedia. In the real world, when something like that important was discredited, it would disappear, but not in the climate change alarmist world. Uh, this is temperature that you'll never really see it this way. This is um, annual temperatures, monthly temperatures for the United States. Uh, the the blue dark dark kind of thing that goes through the middle and then goes up is CO2, how it's climbed. Um, the top is is summers, uh, the summer temperatures. You can see that summers aren't getting a lot warmer. What you can see if you look along the bottom is is winters are not as cool. What's really happening is, is our, and, and you know, I until I got all into this, I you know thought when I was a kid, summers in Wisconsin were really hot. We could count on a week or two where it would be above ninety-five for for all the time. Even at night, it would be very warm. Um, we didn't have air conditioning back then, so I really knew. It. And I thought, well, you know, is that my memory? Am I just remembering it, remembering it poorly? No, actually, it's very true. Um, clouds. Re why is that? Clouds reflect 
uh, the sun during the day, and you've all been out when the clouds cover come over and it drops by five or 10 degrees. I mean, it can be chilling if you're at the beach and clouds cover it up. And then during the night, it holds the temperature in. It keeps it a little warmer at night. So we don't have really global warming. We have a milder, less cold world. And when you take a daytime high that's, say, instead of 90, it's at 80, and you take a nighttime low that instead of is 40, it's 50, well, it's the same temperature as 90 and 40, and, and, that, and that's really what's been going on. There's really nothing to be alarmed at. Uh, this is the month of April. This is from Noah that actually cooks the books, and we'll talk about that, but this is monthly April. Uh, this just shows that on the far right-hand side is 1895. And on the far left-hand side is 2023. And it was actually warmer in 1895 than it was April of 2023. Um, in this graph, if you take a look at it, is this anything to be alarmed at? It's gone up and down and up and down, and this is just what it did. Now, this is April, and every month is different. NOAA adjusts their data. They are scamming us. They have gone back in, and they tinker with it all the time. And I should have put this on, the, uh, on this. I just recently pulled this, this graph, um, uh, something very similar to this graph from NOAA Records. I accessed it six months ago. The exact same graph, the temperature increase changed and got a little bit warmer. The same data yielded a different result just because I accessed it six months later. It's just uh, unbelievable what they're doing. So what happened is, is the blue line is the five-year mean of temperature. And this is the real temperature, the recorded temperature. The red line is the adjusted data. So what they did is they cooled the past because if you notice across the top, it was warmer in the 30s. It was warmer in the early 40s than it is now. But that didn't fit the narrative, so they changed it. Just to give you a little bit of proof is this is from 1936. The number of days, uh, the the num the places that were over 100 degrees, over 95 degrees, and it showed 90 degrees. It shows you in 1936 how hot it was. We don't get things like that anymore. Uh, this is a little bit of a busy ga uh, graph, but it shows this temperature data that during the Dust Bowl, the 1930s, it was very warm. Even taking out the 1930s there's not as much heat, uh, heat days as there is now. That's what these two graphs on the right-hand sh side show, that there was a lot more warmer days back in the 30s and, uh, than there is now. But yet they claim that it's the hottest ever. I mean, it's, it's just really interesting. Well, and it should be actually the opposite. We know what the urban heat island effect is, that it's hotter. I'll go there. Urban heat island effect. In rural farmland, and we've done this, you know, if you're in a tree area, if you're even on farmland, it's cooler than if you go into a city with concrete buildings, heating, air conditioning, all those sort of things. As much as seven or eight degrees um, warmer in cities. So this urban heat island effect means that it's warmer in cities. Now, what's happened is, is NOAA has temperature stations that formerly were in more rural areas and now are in suburban residential areas. And rather, move it, rather than move that temperature gauge from where it was to someplace very similar, they leave it there and then pretend as if the temperature is honest. One of the best examples I think of that is in 1949, they put a temperature and rainfall uh, station in Miami Airport, 1949. Do you think the planes taking off and leaving with all that heat of jet, jet engines and the tarmacs that are hot have increased just a little bit since 1949? But they claim that that's an honest temperature. Again, they adjust the temperature. This just shows it again. And interestingly, they've cooled the past and warmed the present. If you look at the red on the, on the side, they're warming the present the last decade and a half a little bit. If they were adjusting for truthfulness, they should be doing just the opposite. They should be warming the past because there's no herb, uh, urban, heat, urban heat island effect or those stations that have moved from a farm field into a blacktop parking lot 
they should be actually changing those and warming the past more or cooling the present instead of doing exactly the opposite. Arctic heat record. I just put this in here to give you another idea. People, oh, well, you know, you're just making this stuff up. You don't know it. You know, oh, it's unprecedented. It's all, it's never been this bad. Well, this is from 1907. There's other ones from the 1920s and the 1930s. Newspaper articles that people wrote about it back then. That it was 70 degrees in Norway, in Lapland. Iceland was warmer than Ireland. 70 degrees in the north now they'd be telling this right now this is unprecedented the world's overheating all these things this is from 1907 um there's a link that where it comes from there are plenty of these i could you know go on and on i think you've interviewed i know you have tony heller he does tony heller does a great job and this is probably where this came from uh he does a great job of pointing out the history of all of this and the real facts again this is 1923 or 2023 they tell us it's never been warmer we have the hottest times ever, and in fact, we're having less heat across the country than we ever have. And why is North America important? We have the most robust system of temperature gauges, and that's another game that they played. There's 1,200 and temperature, 1,218 temperature gauges in the United States, according to NOAA. Well, only 800 of them are active. The other 400, they just run a computer program and tell us what they are and throw that in the mix. They make up the temperatures for one third of the nation. They make up the temperatures throughout the world and throw them in. I saw a really great graph um, by another guy you might want to interview too. We can talk about that. Is uh, you may have already. You've done such great work um, that where it's hottest recently and, and claiming that the July 2023 was the hottest is all the places that there aren't any good uh, robust temperature stations. So they just make it up. The computer program says it's hot, and then they average it in and go, "Oh, it's hot everywhere." Uh, this this is their their data again. This is NOAA data. This is the last um, let's see, 2005 to September 2022. Where's the emergency in this? Where's the emergency in this? We have some hot day, hot months, and some cold months. Um, that, that's ridiculous. This is the state of temperature records from 1864. So they kind of go back and claim that we know the temperature early, even 1885. It's not very robust even until about 1950. And then pretend as if it's highly, highly accurate. <clears throat> Again, very long. This is 160 million years. Uh, primates developed. We're actually in a CO2 famine. We'd be far better off. Greenhouses routinely add CO2. Their goal is three to five times the CO2 that we have we we actually are in a CO2 deficit, and uh, greenhouses always want to add more. Why? Because it can double production, and they do better with greater heat, and they can tolerate less water. NOAA, NASA says, and this is a study out there, you can find it. Um, fortunately, they haven't made it disappear yet or impossible to find that they attribute a group of scientists studied all the data, and the dark green areas of this picture are more greening. they are more green mass. More plants are growing better. You can see outside of the desert areas of the world and the frozen areas of the world, everything is greening, including around, um, including around deserts. Um, and they attribute 70% of the greening, and they think of about 30 to 40% more greening of the earth just in the last 40 years is attributed to the more CO2 in the atmosphere. CO2 is good. We have forests that have naturally regrown and gotten more, more robust the size of Texas or France. We've added that much greening. Why? They grow better. They grow better, they grow deeper roots, they can access more minerals, they have to in order to grow faster and bigger. We only have about 425 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. Water vapor is the dominant greenhouse gas, and it's 20,000 parts per million, much more than CO2. And methane, kind of the new bogeyman of the climate alarmists, is only two parts per million of the air. But yet we've got to limit it. It would take about 400 years for that to double at present increasing rates. 400 years. It'll take 200 years for CO2 to double at today's rates. It's crazy that we're trying to do this. Another way I try to help in a talking point for people is 
I ask him, would you like to solve today's problems, today's 2023 day, 2023 problems with 1980s technology? Everyone goes, well, no, of course not. I, I wouldn't want that. I mean, I want to solve our today's problems. Do we want to solve 2060 or 2100 problems with 2023 technology? I think it's a really bad idea. Water, vapor, and clouds make up 95% of the greenhouse effect, according to physicist emeritus Dr. Will Happer. I know you've interviewed him. He's great. Um, the, it's just so fascinating. Now, what will happen is I want to address it because I was just reading a, a little bit of information this morning about it. And you get the naysayers, the alarmists go, well, he's a physicist. He really doesn't understand climate. Yeah, that's Actually, it is all about physics. I didn't really understand that well. Yes, it is about how the climate and the earth works on the grand scale, not on the weather. But the physics of all of this, the interactions of the absorption of the sun, the reflection of it, the little molecules bouncing around, it's all physics. The warming is all about physics. And water vapor is the dominant greenhouse gas. It gets ignored. It's far more abundant than CO2. And then one of the other big lies that they have, I don't have a slide for it, but I should, is they go, so, well, you know what? This, well, how this works is, is as CO2 goes up, it causes warming, and warm air can hold more water vapor than cold air. So, therefore, we're going to have runaway greenhouse effect because we'll just get more and more and more water, and that'll just overheat the whole world. They so, said, well, you know, at first it worked for a while. It took me about a year, and then the light bulb went off. Well, wait a minute. We have deserts. We have weather patterns. Just because it's hotter in Death Valley or the Sahara or the Gobi Desert doesn't mean it's wetter. In fact, it's drier there because of the weather patterns. And the other issue is, is there's not a lot of difference for uh, the saturation point for water vapor at the at the um, at the equators when you have 80 um, percent or when you between the 80 degrees and 82 degrees. And in fact, the equators are not warming hardly at all. That's the other part of where they get the climate lie is the poles warming twice as fast as the rest. Well, the equator's not warming much at all. And in fact, it's less cool. So the winters aren't, uh, the likelihood of it freezing during the winter is less. That's why it's a benefit to Florida's winter growing season. So we're getting climate scam. We see pictures like this. They tell us, you know, the seas are rising. Things are going to really be bad. But sea levels have risen about an inch a decade since 1880. In some places like Australia, they haven't, they haven't risen at all. Uh, Australia has not had a rise in sea level hardly at all. Also, 75% of the ocean islands that they claim are going under are actually growing. They grow by a process of called accretion, where sand and coral expand around the islands. They're getting bigger. Um, the Great Bar Barrier Reef is at a maximum now, so you aren't hearing that alarmism anymore, but, it, you know, the reefs are good. And that's the other thing. Oh, well, uh, you know, if the oceans get really hot, all the coral reefs will die. Coral likes really hot water. They like really warm water. It has to be really, really hot for it to die. And some like a, a certain temperature, and if they pass away, others will move in that like it a bit warmer. Uh, there are cold water reefs that are very deep in the ocean, and those who are deep in the ocean aren't going to be affected one way or the other. And, um, you know, a little bit warming will actually be a benefit to um, coral. And it's interesting. It's, it's, it's climate alarmism and the reporting and the propaganda are really upside down world. Virtually everything that they tell us is upside down from what reality is. Uh, just some pictures to help drive this home. Uh, one is the Statue of Liberty uh, from 100 years ago. The other from 115 years ago is the Boston Lighthouse. Uh, the left is uh, Bondi Beach. I think that is in Australia, but you can see that it hasn't changed significantly. I also have great pictures of like, uh, there's a nice picture of where the boys are from um, from Lauderdale, Fort Lauderdale Beach. And uh, 60 years later, it looks the same. I mean, they've had six inches of sea level rise, but that beach looks the same. Um, now the 1970s, we had the coming Ice Age scare. Then in 1988, uh, James Hansen, a NASA um, Scientists claimed that we were going to have terrible global warming, and the UN jumped right on it, got real fast on it. So they were conspiring behind the scenes. I'm very familiar with government from being um, working in it for decades. Um, nothing moves that fast in government, and not particularly when you have uh, 100 plus countries to work on it. But boy, really quickly after that 1988, they had they had their first IPCC. They were on it. They were just spouting this all off. 
So they had that plan. They conspired ahead of time in order to do this. They claimed they would have crop, uh, crop failures and echo, um, echo refugees. They threatened political chaos. They said, we have to solve this really fast. Rising sea levels would be bad. In fact, climate deaths are way down, way down, and continue to go down because we have better technology. Uh, again, just to remind you that we're growing a lot more food on a lot less land, that more people are eating better than ever before in history, and we have more people than ever before in history, exactly the opposite of the propaganda. Uh, again, this is, you know, that, that was cereal crops. This is all crops throughout the whole world. Why? Because we have more CO2, they grow better, more fertilizers, half of which are made, well, they're made with CO2, they're, tra they're after that too better irrigation, better seeds, better growing techniques. But even in nations that don't have better seeds and better growing techniques, plants are growing better because of CO2. The IPCC, supposedly the gold standard <laughs> and their propagandists, uh, tell us that worldwide there's no trend in floods or droughts worldwide. If there are local events, they always happen and always will. Um, in the West, the United States West has always been very, very dry. Uh, this is about 750 on the left, all the way up to present on the right. But the red areas are, are very dry times that we had long, extended, 100-year droughts. And in fact, lately, we've been in wet periods of time for the West and California. Um, but they tell us, again, just the opposite. Uh, violent tornadoes. You can see CO2 is a red line going across and going up. Violent tornadoes are actually down a bit. Uh, global hurricane frequency, again, down a bit, upside down world, exactly the opposite of what's really going on out there. Um, this is snow covered area in the United States. And I do remember when I was a kid, we got a lot more snow and it seemed to stay longer in Wisconsin. Uh, but we do get continue getting snow. I think it does warm up again. It's milder. So the nighttime colds aren't as cold. So it doesn't stick around as much. But we're getting very similar amounts uh, since 1966 all the way until the present. We're getting about the same amount, and this is the Northern Hemisphere. This isn't just the United States, it's the entire nor Northern Hemisphere. Worldwide fires, again, they tell us just the opposite. The world's on fire, it's all burning up. In fact, worldwide fires are down. Uh, this is according to NASA satellite data. You can see the trend line, definitely down. Uh, this is uh, you know the EPA now. The EPA starts their, their um, forest fires. This is thanks to, to the Biden administration and the way they're working it is they're starting in 1983, claiming that we don't have good data prior to 1983. Why? So they can show, if you look over on the right-hand graph, it drops a lot since 1926, all the way down to the low point of 1983. Then they started at 1983, so it looks like it's going up. Um, this is, we just had this, I threw this in here because we just had all, all of the smoke, and I felt it down here just north of Chicago a little bit, Wisconsin, but we had smoke and darkening skies because of those big fires in Canada, and they said, oh, it's unprecedented, it never happened before, it's not happening. Well, actually, on the right, this, uh, this picture is the forest fires that caused darkness throughout in big areas of the United States. They called them yellow days or Black Friday days. Um, May 19th, 1870 was one of the most memorable dark days. Uh, the one on the right, that, that one on the right again is from uh, 1903, June 5th, 1903, the New York Tribune talking about how smoke and dust make it dark. Uh, so these have happened before. They'll happen again, no matter what we do. It's, um, it just is. Um, really, what's really the issue in crazy California is that dry wood creates the fuel that's needed for massive wildfires. And they're doing their best to really stop management of forests. This picture I think is really great because on the right-hand side is an estate managed forest. And you can see how it's green and vibrant and probably a lot less likely to have a big fire. And then if you do control burns on occasion that the Indians always did. And actually the liberal uni University of Stanford professors were allowed to say that we should go back to control burns like the, the tribes used to do would be a really good idea. And on the left-hand side, you can see how gray and dry that forest is. And if that catches fire, it's going up like a tinderbox. Uh, there's great examples of, of states that manage their forests well. Texas, North Carolina, South Carolina, California, or, or Wisconsin, Idaho, all manage forests very well, have a lot of forests, have very few fire, forest fires. California has nutty policies, and Canada has followed uh, in some extent 
not allowing the Indians and uh, their Native Americans, their First Nation people to do controlled burns. And it's such a vast area of forest, it's very hard to control and to clear out the dead brush. Uh, this is our annual tornado count. And since about 1980, we have better uh, ability to see tornadoes. It used to be, think about it, uh, you didn't have cell phones. Unless somebody saw one, you didn't know it happened. Now we have radar, we have cell phones, we have so much ability to detect them. So you can say that you know they've gone up a little bit, but these are our tornado counts. You can, again, you can see there's no great increase of tornadoes. Uh, this is global tropical hurricanes or tropical storms, both tropical storms and hurricanes. You can see the downward trend just a little bit, but again, over the long term, since 1970, the last 50 years, there isn't a trend that shows us that oh my goodness, it's doing what they're claiming it's doing. It's not. These two are together with the plotted CO2, just showing as CO2 has risen, violent uh, tornadoes and hurricane frequency have gone down or have gone down or not much of a change. Uh, worldwide sea ice, again, we hear this, oh, it's melting, it's melting, it's going away. Uh, there's kind of an inverse relationship. When Antarctica's sea ice expands, um, the North Pole sea ice contracts. And again, we have data and they start their measurements um, at, at the end of 1970, but we have satellite data going back into the 60s, um, but they don't want us to see that because it, the sea ice in, in um, the Arctic was much higher. Um, and they pick again, the coldest winter that we had 1978 to start their measurements so that they can show this. But this shows the maximum extent in the, the winter and the minimum extent in the summer, and it's fairly flat. Uh, something we don't ever talk about, the atmosphere. 78% is nitrogen, 21% is oxygen, but they never talk about water vapor. And water vapor is just conveniently left off the chart. And water vapor is the most abundant, important greenhouse gas. If you look at the bottom of this chart, this is 10,000 dots. <coughs> the yellow is 7,800. Uh, 2,100 would be oxygen. I added in the 2% that's water vapor. Then you've got argon that no one talks about. Then you got CO2. It's just four out of 10,000. And less than one of them comes from humans. And they claim that that's driving everything. I, have, I liken it to, I think you have a, a five, there's about 560 drops in an um, ounce. So you take your favorite alcohol, for those of you who drink, you take your favorite alcohol, you put your ounce in, and you add 11 drops. That would signify the CO2. Then you drink it, and you have a few drinks, and what the alarmists tell us is that it's all CO2 that causes those effects. That's just kind of crazy. Or you have an ounce, of, or you have a can of gasoline, 128 ounces. You add two ounces of, of additional fuel to it. And then you travel, and you say, oh, all the distance we travel was the extra two ounces. It's just very dishonest. It's just really very dishonest. And keep at it and keep at it. And for have, you know, have regular people being duped by it is just wrong. Uh, this just shows real quickly the inverse relationship. There are times when CO2, which is in red, has gone up and temperature has gone down and vice versa. There's just not a really strong long-term relationship between the two. Uh, John Coleman, the founder of the Weather Channel, a climatologist, a weatherman. Climate is just weather over the long term. He's he over and over. Climate warming is fictional, manufactured crisis, and a total scam. Chris Martz is a young guy who posts on Twitter quite a bit, and he's studying um, this whole area. And it's kind of interesting. I just put this up because he was a doomer himself, like most uh, our, our propagandized youth. And then he really dug into it and educated himself. And then he found out there's nothing to be concerned of. Uh, Michael Crichton, who wrote a great book, State of Fear is a really great book. It's novelized of, of the scam of and the money part of the whole climate scam. But he talks about the fact that science really is about verifying things in the real world. There's not a single peer-reviewed paper and for those talking points. There's not a single peer-reviewed paper that proves CO2 is driving the warming of the climate. Not a single one. They cannot produce it. So if you ever talk to a climate alarmist, ask them to produce that. And if they do throw something at you from time to time, I have gotten them, and then I read it, and then they always start with this, the, the premise and the assumption, CO2 is warming the climate. Or it's warmed, and we have more CO2. Therefore, they, that happened. Well, you, there's a lot of correlations out there, like shark attacks or other things that you could claim, claim those same things for. And again, you got the speed of sound. 
the speed of light and the speed of money is now the speed of science. Uh, consensus is utterly irrelevant to science. Albert Einstein said when they challenged him, the Nazis didn't like the fact that this Jew came up with something that was really important. And they wrote a book. There are only 20 authors. It tells you about propaganda. There are only 20 authors, but they named the book 100 Authors Against Einstein. They were German scientists. They, they refuted his relative, uh, theory of relativity, um, made some press. You know, of course, you got 20 scientists, 100 scientists claiming he was wrong. And they asked him, and he said, well, if I were wrong, why do they need, why do they need 100? One would be enough. Um, I think it's really, it's the way science actually works. Uh, Dr. Will Happer and Dr. Dick Linsen, professors of physics at MIT and at Princeton, uh, tell us that we no longer have a peer review process. It's been replaced by PAL review. Dr. Linsen talks about he had two great climate papers that he had published back in the early 90s. And in both cases, the, the scientific journal that published them, the managers that allowed them to be published were fired. That's how this works. Scientists who know if they don't toe the party line and claim that disaster is going to happen, no longer receive federal funding, often lose their jobs. And if they have tenure, at the very least, they know their career path is no longer up. And they don't get invited to the cocktail parties anymore. Uh, what is climate change about? It's really about money, power, and greed. It's about control, control of energy, controlling all of us. It's about redistribution. Um, this is a co-chair of a working group of the IPCC, um, a doctor, Admin Andenhofer. He said, you know, it isn't about the truth. It isn't about reality. It's about something else. And it's, it's really evil, folks. It's evil. The facts just don't support it. It's a catastrophic, fake cat catastrophe used to instill fear and guilt to tax us and regulate us, take away our freedom. Um, to institute control. Uh, I say climate change hysteria is actually a mental illness uh, or a religion or both. Um, it's just simply not real. And what could go wrong? A lot. Uh, remind you of Sri Lanka. They went wrong. And this is from the World Economic Forum in the UN. This is what these people are, are advocating. Uh, crop harvest tanked there um, and their economy tanked. Um, it imploded and their ESG score went up. ESG score and standard of living are inversely related, meaning when ESG score goes up, your standard of living or your company performance goes down because it's expensive for no good purpose. Netherlands, Ireland, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, they've all proposed uh, reducing nitrogen fertilizers 30 to 50% in the next few years. Half the world eats because of nitrogen fertilizers. They're necessary in addition to the warming and CO2. Uh, the climate reason, they want to, not, not because it's made with, with methane, not because it creates CO2, but because it's nitrogen fertilizer. It's N2O, two nitrogen and one oxygen. Never mind that 78% of our air is nitrogen and 20% of our air is oxygen. Never mind that. Uh, we, we need to limit fertilizers. Ireland has proposed killing 200,000 milk cows, the government, to save the climate. 200,000 milk cows, because they don't want as much cheese to be made. So, you know, what are all those farmers, cheesemakers, and cheese-consuming public going to do? I mean, it's nutty stuff, and it won't change the climate. Um, they'll create food shortages. They're working on that. And I, I believe, and we should all believe, and we should be talking about it, starving billions of people, driving up food costs is evil. When you have high food and high energy costs, it causes starvation, civil unrest, which provides a way to control people. They're even trying to talk about that now. That, that's part of this idea is to make things terrible for regular people. Then they must be controlled. Capitalism must have. So what they're really doing is attacking capitalism. They're attacking our great way of life. It is the golden goose that lays the eggs. We got to have private property. You need the rule of law. You need reasonable rule of private contracts. You need free exchange of ideas, goods, and services. And you have to have reliable, affordable, abundant energy. And I'd throw in there a good food supply. Uh, our, our policy is driven by false climate change narrative. 
not China, Russia, India, Asia, or African policy. The problem with Africa is they can't get the money. Otherwise, they build more coal plants because the West won't lend them money. And they don't have the infrastructure. They don't have the capitalism. They don't have the infrastructure to actually pay for it and collect. So this is a dangerous tool used by leftists. It's fake and it's built on lies on a grand scale and it continues on. In order to fix the climate, we must control energy and the food supply of everyone. It's a tool to control energy and food supply. And the leftists want to control everything. And really, this here's the kicker, just like we've already seen. We have very wealthy people flying around the earth on their private jets and telling us that we have to be limited and we should swap out bugs for meat at least some of the time. We should limit our consumption while they excessively consume and have multiple homes. And they buy beachfront property like Obama. Um, they'll be exempt. This is about control and going back to the days where the king and queen lived like king and queens and the serfs lived in grass huts. It's raw. We enjoy a great standard of living, and I want more people to enjoy that. Um, the way they'll do this, people say, well, well, how could they possibly do this? The way they'll do this is they will, and they're working on it right now. They'll issue all of us a CO2 uh, carbon allotment per month. And if you're a little old, this is how they'll sell it. If you're a little old lady who uses very little, you can sell your excess CO2 um, indulgences and you can make a little extra money. And if you're wealthy, you can buy those CO2 indulgences so you can carry on. If you're middle class and you get to the 25th of the month and you've used your CO2 allotment up, no beer, no meat, uh, no cheese, no gas, you can't buy anything because you've used your CO2 allotment up. They want degrowth and depopulation. Recently, Kamala, our Vice President Kamala Harris made the slip of the tongue to talk about, you know, all of this renewable energy and depopulation. That's really ultimately what they believe. They believe 8 billion of us is too many and that somehow we have to have less. They believe it'll be other hundreds of millions of people, not you or me, or at least that's what the leftists think. Um, it will cause economic chaos. If we shrink everything, there's less work, less money, less food, less of everything, and they will have to limit everything. It is horrendously bad. And the data doesn't support the climate emergency. Not at all. I hope I've showed you this, but this is it. It doesn't, and their solutions will not fix it. The Earth's been both much warmer and colder, and with both more and less CO2. So how, how is CO2 the driver? Uh, it's fake and made up on purpose to do the things I'm talking about. It's built on lies and propaganda. It's kept going by data tampering, censorship, bullying, deception, and spin. And money, of course. There's trillions of money in the green industrial complex, and it's at our expense, regular people's expense. Um, we don't really understand the high costs of the energy transition, but we're going to. So as we feel higher costs and the pain that goes with it, I think people are going to become more receptive to the information I've provided, and they're going to look for reasons to rationalize. Why is the energy transition unnecessary? Because it is unnecessary, but I think they'll become much more receptive to an argument for that. And ending fossil fuel use is expensive and dangerous, particularly to the West. And China is our rival, and why do they get a buy? They already have a totalitarian dictatorship and we don't. So they get a buy, and we are supposed to do all these unnecessary things at great expense. We need to translate this into good politics and right-thinking politicians who will protect us from what's going on here. Um, we don't need very expensive, unreliable blackout, regular blackouts and cars we can't afford. We don't need any of that, and we shouldn't have it. So my call to action is people need to internalize some of this, talk to others, particularly young people. They aren't going to like it. Um, and unfortunately, we live in a world right now where if people tell you facts that disagree with their feelings. They get mad at you and think that uh, you're wrong because they feel differently. And it's unfortunate, but it's true. But we got to keep at it because we're going to pay for it. Um, our Democrat policy now, energy policy, is, is going to create astronomical energy prices, energy insecurity, and eventually food shortages. So I have a call for action for folks. Tell everyone. That was really good. Well, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, it's it's a lot of territory to cover, and um, 
you know, there's so much more you can put in it. There's, there's just so much, of course, because it concerns everything. I mean, it concerns everything, both in the terms of us are having good lives, building good lives, helping more people, and the weather and the climate that we all, you know, often take for granted. But it, it is, you know, it's fascinating, and it's just really important, folks. Um, so kind of sorry to give you a wall of fire hose of information, um, but it's, um, I, I mean, it, it, I think it stands for itself. Have you delivered this one uh, to real audiences at all? And to Yeah, have I have. I mean, I, each time I try to keep making it a little bit better, I add a little things, but this 90% of this I gave to a couple audiences a couple months ago. Um, always well received. Um, most of the people already get it. But unfortunately, we're not able to have a real debate with someone who's knowledgeable on the other side. There's only a couple of professors who will actually engage. Um, and you, you don't generally get someone who's um, willing to even consider anything. You know, climate alarmists won't come to any of these presentations. And as soon as you start, they shut right down. They, they want any part of it. So you're, you're getting people who already may believe that this is all a problem or, or a scam. And then you're reinforcing and giving them, them information. Or you, you do have some people in the audience or others that are dragged along that are like, wow, I never really thought about it or knew anything about it. Um, and unfortunately, the, the vast majority of people who are in the middle um, polling, and I, that was also part of something I often cover, is polling in America would be worse in Europe, but it's changing. Europe is starting to hit the wall. Um, they're, they're starting to swap out governments now. It looks like Spain's government is going to, well, I think that was last night, actually. I think that their, their more rightist government is starting to back away from this as people are starting to find out how expensive and unworkable it is. But you know, poll people in America and they say, you know, is there man-made, is, is there climate change? Yes. Is man contributing? Yes. Should we f do something about it? Yes. Do you want to pay for it? Heck no. Big time no. I mean, People are like, yeah, I'll pay ten dollars a month, but I don't want to pay any more than that. You you get up to like fifty or hundred, and like eighty percent of the people say, I don't want to pay it. They have no idea we're already paying a lot more than that. It's built into everything that we're already doing behind the scenes. So it's but that that and those people in the middle decide elections, and we have politicians, those who are right thinking. And I've given this, you know, not this one recently, but I've given it to some various politicians. And um, we've seen this with our state senator in Wisconsin, Ron Johnson, who had a private event, but then was filmed and publicized and then got attacked mercilessly um, by the, the media of being a climate denier, climate denier. Because as soon as you say, well, yeah, the climate changes, um, but man's not causing it. Well, you're a climate denier. We don't have to listen to anything else you say. It's the biggest interesting game I've ever seen. Okay. Uh, any other points you want to make before we go ahead and wrap up? Um, no, I feel like I've covered pretty much all of it. Um, you know, I think the, some of the important points are is, is, you know, this, it's propped up by fake data. We don't know precisely what the temperature was more than 50, 70 years ago. And they continue to, you know, cook the temperature books on purpose. And CO2, I guess one of the biggest points is more CO2 is a mass benefit for Earth, for people for wildlife, for animals, and there is no mass extinction more. You know, I didn't cover that. That's another part of the, the BS that we keep hearing. Um, more CO2, a gently warming world, of slightly longer uh, growing seasons, all good things. Truly, it's upside down world. These are good things and should be celebrated. And we should be spending our money, instead of wasting it on this, on making lives better, on figuring out how to get the, the soils to grow even more, on fertilizing the ocean. 70% of the ocean are deserts, largely because there's a lack of iron within the ocean. And phytoplankton would produce even more um, animals, or more, more uh, fish and everything in the ocean. It would feed the world better. We should be looking at going to the moon with our money um, and colonizing, well, bad word, you're not supposed to use any of those words anymore, but having people live permanently on the moon, looking to expand onto Mars, looking and not wasting our money on really Luddite uh, solutions. Wind and solar have been around forever. They're really Luddites uh, trying to ruin our technology um, for, for an ideology that makes no sense whatsoever, and our money would be so much more wisely spent to benefit all of us on the things that I mentioned. 
Okay, so thank you very much, Frank Lassay. I really appreciate you taking the time. I enjoyed your presentation. I'll talk to you hey, next you're time. You're very welcome. Right. You're very welcome. Thank you. Right. Goodbye. Bye.